welcome to the Reformed Devils. I'm Dr. Owen Anderson, and I'm here with my good friend, Dr. John Barth. Nice to see you. And we're Reformed, we're both confessional, and we believe in the, the highest good is the glory of God, knowing the glory of God and all that by which he's made himself known. And we're devils in this sense that we're professors at Arizona State University, the Sun <laughs> Devils. So we're Reformed Devils in that sense, but we're also recognizing that we're born into this world as sinners. And we're born into this world needing redemption. And so we emphasize that as the Reformed Devils. And, and we're here to talk to you about what it's like to be a professor at the largest research university in the United States and in our specific fields of philosophy and history. We're continuing a second video now on critical theory. Last time we looked at the philosophical roots uh, of critical theory, Kant, Rousseau, and today we're going to get into some of the 20th century thinkers. Mm -hmm. Next time, in our third video about it, we're going to answer, we, we've got some great questions that came in from the first video and probably from this one also, and we're going to answer some questions from the audience. So if you, if you have some, leave those on YouTube on either one of our channels, and that's what the next one will be for. But I know that also in the future, something just happened in Arizona just today, which is groundbreaking. And we need to get a, a, a video out on this, which is school choice was funded in a way that it has never been before. So that uh, they have funding now, not for school systems, but for each individual child in Arizona. Hmm. And there was a great amount of resistance. I, I was pessimistic. I didn't think it was going to pass, uh, or at least not now. I thought maybe 2024 after that election but it got passed and went through today. Yeah. So this is groundbreaking for school choice and freedom for parents to choose what they think is the best path for their own child. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, Dr. Anderson and I are both, are both uh, uh, parents. And, um, and so education, very a critical subject. And, and you know what? Uh, oh, and we, we, we teach these students after they're done with their K through 12, don't we? Yeah. So we have yep. a vested interest in that. Yep. respect too. <laughs> yeah, um, I see. I see what's coming out. And uh, I, I'm more and more surprised about where my freshman students are at. <laughs> Well, it makes it difficult actually to teach because some of my students are just really, I mean, like these, these, these students could be in an Ivy League, you know, school yeah. and then, and then, but it's all over, it's all, it's the whole yeah. gamut. Well, but that's the thing, is, yep. you know, we, yeah. Uh, so today we want to talk about, continue our conversation of critical theory as, as Owen um, uh, noted. Um, what is critical theory? It's such a big subject. And I think really what it is, it's not just critical thinking. I mean, Dr. Anderson yeah. and I are both supporters of that, of course. Um, but yep. it is uh, critically examining systems, uh, discourses, that's very important, language, in order to, dis to expose and disrupt power dynamics. That's a pretty good um, good simple one yep. sentence definition. Um, the concepts, if you read critical theorists, concepts of power, language, knowledge are all very important. And critical theorists on the whole, and, and they're, they're all, of course, this is a broad umbrella field, um, but they generally view society as divided between dominant and marginalized mm -hmm. identities Yep. And it's the dominant group that creates these superstructures that um, oftentimes deliberately um, or perhaps unconsciously uh, uh, creates the uh, uh, it influences power and language and, and all the rest in order to uh, dominate these marginalized groups. Intersectionality is very important in critical theory, and that's when a person falls within an intersection of uh, multiple oppressed identities. And critical theorists are very uh, uh, um, attuned to hidden biases, mm -hmm. um, problematics, um, underexamined assumptions that they believe serve the dominant interest, mm -hmm. and it, it and it's integrated into uh, many different fields: um, history, political science, sociology, anthropology, really all the social sciences. Yeah, social law, sciences especially. Law, yeah. But we're also finding it more and more 
um, in in hard sciences. Yeah, Dr. Anderson. I mean, it, you're seeing it in mathematics now too. Yeah. Um, so where does this all come from? And and um, I believe uh, Dr. Anderson is going to talk about Habermas. I, I, I'd like to um, go into Frankfurt School, but do you have anything else to say? It, it is funny. There's a kind of division still in philosophy. So it has, you know, the analytics branch still may keep some distance from it. I had a graduate professor who said, uh, one of the students in the class brought up brought up Derrida and he said, well, I said, just a minute, they do that stuff in the English department. This is philosophy. So, but uh, there's still, there's still, um, a similar kind of relativism that I'm going to emphasize today when we look at Habermas. Yep. Um, but tell us about the Frankfurt School. What's that? Yeah, the Frankfurt School is um, very important to the history of, of critical theory. Um, the Frankfurt School, it, it was a, it's a, uh, dates back to an institute, um, the Institute for Social Research created in Frankfurt in the Weimar Republic in 1923. And it was actually the first Marxist research center at a German university. It was founded by a Marxist professor of law who was at the University of Vienna, but um, he established this Institute for Social Research at Goethe University in Frankfurt. Now, even though he's a Marxist, he was dissatisfied with classical Marxism and believed that it was... Um, that he, it needed an update for the 20th century. Um, he and other scholars uh, who joined the Frankfurt School, probably the most well-known of the Frankfurt scholars, well, there's a few, there's Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, later Herbert Marcuse, um, but they- and, uh, and one of the, and when he says an update, what he's thinking, just for our audience mind, is how to get the revolution going in different countries. Yeah, because- So it so happened like, in Russia- uh -huh. How do we have it in Germany, England, United States? Well, and and also there was, without going into too much of the historical detail, there was a there was a failed Marxist revolution in Germany following the end of World War One. Mm -hmm. Failed in 1918, 1919. Failed, and then so uh, the members of this Frankfurt School they were dissatisfied with the sort of the contemporary systems. Of course, you had the rise of fascism in this period in Italy and Germany. But they were also dissatisfied with Soviet communism, um, with Leninism. They saw it as too inflexible ideologically. Um, this is some of the difference between the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Yeah, that's right. right. And, yeah, of course, and, and one thing to add, too, for, for younger listeners who might say, well, a communist revolution, that sounds great. Because that means that the government cares for all the weakest members of society. But remember, these, these movements, these historical movements that you're mentioning, were explicitly atheist. Mm -hmm. And they they rooted the problem in culture as Christian religion. So this is not just a social movement to help poor people. This is an explicit yeah. attack against any Christianity. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. And and so they in in um so the Frankfurt School wants to fill in some of those omissions that they that they perceived in classical Marxism, and so they want to examine the entire societal um, superstructure, as, as it was called, the culture, the uh, institutions, political power. Um, yes, the economics, but also customs, norms. Because um, they saw all those were influenced mm -hmm. by, especially in the West compared to Russia, where the church had been weaker because it was connected to the czar. In the mm -hmm. West, they saw that Christianity had influenced all of these things. And so if you're really going to have an economic uh, re revolution, you've got to get rid of those other things also. Right. Um, gender like roles was also like they included yeah. that in in yeah. their uh, super. Well, that was always there from Marx. He always said the father is the king of the family. You got to get rid of that king. Yep, yep. And it's a, com a it's a competing source of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Um, the family and uh mm -hmm. in the church, of course. Um, but Max Horkheimer, he in um well, uh, in the 1930s they they relocated because of the rise of fascism. Um, it, they were pr predominantly Jewish intellectuals and being Marxist, of course, um, uh, uh, there was an antagonism between them and the rise of the, um, of the Nazi party. And so they left Frankfurt, first to Geneva, and then went to New York City in 1935 and sort of merged with Columbia University. And so that's when some of these ideas were transferred over, over to Columbia. But Max Horkheimer said, define critical theory as this project of, it's an emancipatory project to liberate human beings from 
uh, this is a quote, to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. And so it's a, it's a program to affect social change and to get beyond sort of the dogmatic assumptions in that, in, from the past and mm -hmm. some of those, some of those superstructures that we talked about, it, um, they focus pretty heavily on capitalism in the, in the twenties and thirties, but increasingly by the 1940s and then by the 1950s, they broadened their critique to Western civilization. Yeah. Cultural and, critique. Yeah, that's right. And, um, probably the, another very famous member of the of the frankfurt school was herbert marcuse mm -hmm. who um is was really the in the 1960s and 1970s the like foremost theorist of the he came to uh, kind of a pop icon yeah that's right he was a pop icon he was the he was the leading theorist of the new left yeah um and uh a very radical like um utilized marxist methodology and actually self-labeled himself as a marxist but very critical mm -hmm. soviet communism yeah um, he saw it as too oppressive a form of social control he's very um but he also broadened his critique beyond that he's very um critical of entertainment culture of mm -hmm. uh a modern technology consumerism course, capitalism. yep the whole the one the one dimensional man was his big book right and so the frankfurt school those ideas then filtered um, outward into other universities and became um, became popularized uh, over time. And there's more you could say you could say about that. But um, they also uh, a, a bit different from from the Marxists, they were um, the Frankfurt School really made was a lot more hesitate hesitant to make claims on absolute truth on universal truths. Um, and, and I and they were definitely influenced in part by uh existentialism and, mm -hmm. and postmodernism. yeah um living after world war ii and the collapse of some of the great ideals of marxism led to these problems right like how, how do we live a meaningful life in a materially materialist universe which is meaningless mm -hmm. yeah and so you know anything like a meta meta narratives yeah. um all all that came, came under attack as a, as the product of um, this power dynamic of, of the ruling class, the dominant classes, um, uh, and that's where we can in power. Give, give a phrase for our listeners: self-referential absurdity, which you sometimes run into. You don't want to be self-referentially absurd, mm -hmm. and what that means is, if what you're saying, when applied to itself, leads to a contradiction, it's not true. Mm -hmm. So if you say all mm -hmm. meta narratives whatever mm -hmm. are wrong or power struggles. Well, that means your meta narrative is just a power mm -hmm. struggle, right? right? So they, they want us to somehow believe that they're neutral mm -hmm. and just examining other people's meta narratives and power struggles rather than, well, the truth is then that you're one of the parties in the combat. You're putting yourself out there as the one who explains reality. You finally understood all of reality. You can explain it to the rest of us and you think your view should be followed. And if I may say like, like the, I think the postmodernism in the last couple of decades has there's been a turn away from postmodernism, sort of the radical subject subjectivity um, yeah. in in the recent manifest in the recent critical theory and what is popularly known as wokeness, um, because I think there there are many people at least um, on the ground who would assert that there is actually uh, or who who at least. Uh, act as though there is absolute truth. Um, yeah, and justice, for example, that, that's a big push, right? It, right? In that group is to say, we need equity, we need justice, and those are meta narratives that mm -hmm. apply to all people. Right, and that's where, we'll talk about Foucault in a minute, because I know you're gonna, or a, a little later, because you're gonna go into Habermas, but that's where like there's this divergence between, because Foucault would totally reject a lot of what mm -hmm. you hear from modern critical theory, and yet he was integral to the, to the evolution of critical theory as we know it today. And well, so it's almost the paradox. It's almost the debate between him and Chomsky, right? And Chomsky, it, his view is that there are these th big, big ideas like justice that we need to uh, need to apply. And Foucault was more just like a radical uh, anti-federalist, yeah, just local <laughs> government, complete local government. No, no big ideas like that applied to all the world. So you maybe can, that, yeah, that, that Chomsky branch might be doing well right now. You can, you can watch that debate, by the way, on YouTube. Yeah, 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 you yeah. can check that out. Um, 
and really see two of the formative thinkers for the last 40 years. That's probably in the 70s, right? Yes, I think it was in the 70s. Yeah. So that's 50 years now, man. I got to keep up on the dates. <laughs> that means we're getting, that means we're approaching that age. Of <laughs> I'm, I'm turning 39 in a few months. Guys. Yeah. Well, at least we, at least we can't say when I was in the audience of the Habermas Chomsky debate or the uh, yes. uh, Foucault Chomsky debate, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I want to look at uh, Jurgen Habermas, who mm. I think if they were to put generations, you've you've discussed the first two generations. I believe he's considered the third generation Frankfurt School, mm. and mm -hmm. yep. his emphasis he continues that same emphasis of critical evaluation of cultures, but. What stands out about him is that he evaluates it in terms of reason and the use of reason to make changes and trying to figure out how can we best make changes through argumentation. So that can sound kind of attractive. That is attractive. And, and I think even what you said a moment ago about wanting to offer a critique of culture and dogmatic beliefs that's all, that's what we do in philosophy. Like, that's why I'm in philosophy. I like to do that stuff. So we can hear these things and we can say, yeah, that's really good. I want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to question those things. So that's not the problem. In other words, some of the things when you read what he says about reason, some of the things he says are just right on. That the ideal society is the one that uses reason and argumentation to come to consensus. Mm -hmm. So that's, his, that's what he's saying as opposed to power. And the truth of the matter is that in the 19th century, European power structures did use power to harm even their own citizens and then globally. So it's not as if you want to deny that truth. So he's he's looking around to say, well, what do we need to do? But he recognizes a problem. Well, one more thing about power. And it kind of came out in something you were saying as well. When they're doing this critique, sometimes the critique is objective. What I mean by that is uh, John... Uh, Barth gave an argument, and here I'm going to evaluate it. Or he has these assumptions that I can prove. But sometimes he goes the route of psychoanalysis. Mm. And so I think that first half we would agree with. The second half we would disagree with. And what I mean by psychoanalysis is that you have hidden mo mo uh, motives that you're not even aware of. And they're not like they're not beliefs, because that's where you can say, yeah, you have some assumptions you haven't thought of, and here they are. It's more like what Freud, psychoanalysis, what yeah. Freud does, sexual development when you're a baby, and then you're, you're developing certain attitudes. Those could be true, but they're still based on beliefs. Mm -hmm. So he kind of toggles back and forth between what I'd call the cognitive and the non-cognitive. And you can see how the non-cognitive can be weaponized against people. And you can say, you have all these things about you. They're non-cognitive. They're not based on beliefs. And I can't evaluate them with you, but they're wrong. And, and then you're sort of like, well, then what do I do about them? Well, you have to give yourself to me to let me be in charge and I'll fix them. Mm -hmm. So he toggles between those two because of that Freudian influence. And I think that's one of the things we would critique. I mean, if I was to say anything about Habermas, it would be, yes, let's use what he said, including on Habermas. Let's use, use reason to examine him. And so uh, the, let me see, I had some notes here. Um, it raised this question, I guess, for, for Christian, young Christian students who might be listening, any student. But if you're a Christian, what happens is people say, well, it seems like he's got some good ideas, mm -hmm. but I know I disagree about the atheism part. Mm -hmm. So do I just ignore all of Habermas or do I read some and I'm, and I get interested in Habermas and I see that come up with a, in a lot of settings. I mean, it could be you could raise that same question about Aristotle for Aquinas. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, Aristotle doesn't is not a theist, but he seems to have some good ideas. You know, how do we approach those? So I think it's a good opportunity for us in our in our mm -hmm. setting because someone could say, look, these guys are just using the second commandment. They're just loving their neighbor and they want to make society better. Why are you guys such such haters? Mm -hmm. Why do you have to critique them? So I think what we find is that. Sometimes thinkers like this are more attuned to the problems in the world than Christians might be. And we can study them and start to say, yeah, you know what? These are problems that we need to fix. There's some, there's some issues in the world that need attention. But that doesn't mean we have to accept their method for doing it. Mm -hmm. We should be able to both notice the problem, say, yeah, that is a real question, and then 
evaluate their solution, which in this case, like I said, it tends to go towards a kind of psychoanalysis of culture, using Freudianism on all of culture. Right. And of course, I think uh, the next video will, we can um, detail why, why yeah. we, uh, you know, a Christian response to some of, to some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Habermas, it seemed like his, uh, he, he, his contribution is using Freudian analysis. Um, well, and arguing that society is rational mm -hmm. and that we should come to agreement through rational arguments and, mm -hmm. and, and get to a consensus. And I mean, that's great. That's what we do in, in the sciences. For example, you have a hypothesis, you test it, you write a paper, you go to a conference and present it to your peers and you debate it. Mm -hmm. And so you could do the same thing he's saying in ethics and in, in morality or politics. And that's not the problem. The problem comes in in this sense. He doesn't apply that same method to his own materialism. Mm -hmm. If his materialism is true, then advanced monkeys with, with a little bit bigger frontal lobes can't do his method. And then even once he's done that critique, he doesn't consider the what is called the noetic effects of sin. So he speaks about the idealized citizen and the idealized language, because language is ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So even if we try to argue and debate, we can't a lot of times just because we trip up our, on our own words. But the reason why language is not perfect is due to sin. And so his solution requires a kind of perfect human. It's what you see in um, a, another uh, uh, political theory as well, like Rawls, an idealized person who makes great choices for society. But humans are sinners and they need redemption. Right. So this that's just back, not going to work. And, it's, and that takes us back to the Rousseau, which we talked about in the first part of this. But um, it does open this. One of, the, one of the discussions I have to have the most with with Christians interested in theology or philosophy is about what reason is. The word reason, put it in quotes, mm -hmm. is, is so ambiguous. They stumble over it all the time. So when he's using reason, he means the laws of thought, like non-contradiction, identity, mm -hmm. and then the laws of logic, which are the laws of inference. And those guide us in thinking and in making arguments. Mm -hmm. Those aren't fallen. Because Christians, and maybe especially Reformed Christians, want to say reason's fallen. Well, the law of non-contradiction can't be fallen any more right, than 2 plus right. 2 is fallen. Right. But the reasoning process is fallen. That's a verb now, reasoning. Right. And so he might say, look, if we're ideal thinkers, we'd do this. We'd reason that way. But mm -hmm. we're not ideal thinkers. We don't reason that way. And we should. That's why we're guilty. We should use reason to know what God's revealed about himself. But we don't. Right. And the second mistake that comes up is they'll say, yeah, but they only have general revelation. They needed scripture mm -hmm. as if scripture is more clear rather than they're both clear. And you use reason to read scripture. Also, if you don't know how to read, you're not going to be able to read scripture. You don't know how to think. You're not going to be able to think through the arguments that Paul gives. Paul gives a number of arguments. Sometimes it's like, bomb, 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 bomb. You got argument, argument, argument. You got to be able to follow arguments to understand what Paul's saying. Right. So again, the problem there isn't reason and scripture somehow trumps reason the problem is the noetic effects mean you're not reasoning to mm. think through it so he doesn't even touch that problem so it, it's it's almost like his hopes are so obviously impossible if you're living in the 20th century especially you should know this won't happen that it should have made him look for this problem of where do we get redemption mm. Mm -hmm. so um and and it, it, the last video we talked about Rousseau and his belief that man is naturally good and that, that seems to, to yeah there's some overlap. Um, well, and think about Rousseau. Rousseau had enough by the, by the, by his life there've been there've been atrocities throughout history, mm -hmm. but part of what creates the existential crisis that you mentioned earlier for existentialism is World War One and World War Two. Mm -hmm. So how can you be living post World War Two? And still think there could be an idealized thinker who will make a great society. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the existentialists are, it's just ironic that they're saying, I can't, materialism ends in a meaningless universe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Therefore, we have to make our own meaning. No. Oh, versus materialism ends in a meaningless universe. Yes. So therefore, I need to look outside <laughs> right. materialism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Now, I'm pushing back a little bit. I don't want to go too off far off the track but um you know in the uh i don't know how familiar you are with the debate between burke and Paine over the french revolution i think there was this tendency during you know you see it in um 
age of reason for Thomas Paine. Um, mm -hmm. And this idea that, that mm -hmm. everything in society, including customs and norms and and different roles, some of the superstructures that are discussed in by the Frankfurt School, yeah. um, that each of those needs a rationality, um, and and the problem with that is there are some some institutions where it's either difficult to come up with an immediate rationale, mm -hmm. or um, or we're just obstructed for one reason or another yeah and burke um there's well actually moving beyond burke there's that famous uh allegory from gk chesterton of if you see like the the fence or a gate i can't remember which it was in a field somewhere or that's blocking a path mm -hmm. you know the sort of the the reformer the progressive will want to immediately dismantle it yeah it's like well what's that there for I, yeah i can't see any reason for it yeah. Okay, what is GK Chesterton says? He says, No, not gonna allow you to tear that down. First, I want you to go home, think about it, find yeah. uh, and then discover what the purpose of that fence was. And then once you discover what the purpose was, mm -hmm. then maybe we can talk about dismantling it. Yep. You know, but there is that it, this can be taken too far by the appearance men. To, yeah, to the appearance think, of oh, you know, I can't I the existence of men and women is that's not rational and and then you can use through the yeah, arrogance yeah. of of your intellect to because pride is the is is really the the core sin in man i mm -hmm. i believe i mean mm -hmm. it's pride in the garden satan appeals what yeah to, as you can be like god and so you can take while reason is a gift from god it's part of what makes us in the image of god um, you can't, there's this tendency in, in the pride of man to, to believe that we can use reason to understand everything. And it doesn't always work that way. You may, now we may have a disagreement about this, but that, that's kind of my, um, I, I think under, I think on, 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 on underneath all that we agree, but it's part of highlighting my point, which is the word reason is so ambiguous mm -hmm. because you, you use the word rationale. Mm -hmm. So when you were speaking about reason right now, you mean something more like purpose. So what's the purpose of male and female? I don't see one. So let's get rid of them. Someone could say, right. Yeah. Um, but I'm speaking about reason more like the very thing by which we form ideas like male and female. So that's still a different use of reason. We form the idea of God and not God creation and not creation. And then we begin to build beliefs from there. So Chesterton is is suggesting, look, there's traditions that we built up. We don't always remember the reason for them. And you should make sure you think about why the reason there meaning purpose. So I agree about that 100%. Yeah. Um, but that, that whole time period had these guys speaking boldly in the name of reason. Thomas Paine, you mentioned him. And his book, uh, The Age of Reason, is just it's a kind of a dumb book. It's like a sea level book. I mean, it's, you have to read it because it's part of history, but if it wasn't, you wouldn't right. read it ever. And what he yeah. means by reason, really, I would call practical rationality. Mm -hmm. and, and that's also what some of these guys, these existentialists and Marxists are, are arguing uh, or Frankfurt schools arguing against is that we have these ways of doing things, practical rationality that we've made for our own power but they may not work for a democratic society and they have to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Kafka is the best critique of that, right? So he, he gets through, his characters get thrown into a situation where you're arrested, you're on trial, you don't know why, you can't find the judge or the prosecutor. Every time you go to a bureaucrat, they send you somewhere else. So there's a whole system that they've built up and you don't know why any of it's there. So all of that, I would agree with 100%, but I would still come back to you and say there's this most basic thing where reason is, I think the phrase in the confession, the light of nature. Mm. It's that by which we think at all. We make distinctions and we know God is God and I'm not God. Mm -hmm. And that level of reason, pain didn't use, he should have. Mm -hmm. He rejected the, his need for redemption. And Habermas doesn't get back to that either. So um, it, unless there's anything else you want no, to say No, I think that's Habermas. good. I think... I think this idea, the, the other thing that he emphasizes is uh, using reason to come to consensus. To do that, we need an ideal language. And to do the ideal language, we need a kind of absolute freedom. Mm. So you see these values build up. And absolute freedom in an existentialist sense. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, he's speaking politically and existentially, right? But if you yeah. have a system where you're told what to believe, that's the dogmatic part, then mm-hmm. that's not really a free society where you can use your mind to come to agreement. Seems like the issue with a lot of these thinkers is that they they despise authority. Yeah, well, I think so. I think there's a fundamental rejection of all authority coming out of, I'll just call, call it an abusive situation, coming out of an abusive situation. Right. Why on earth do we have World War One and World War Two? Yeah. I mean, some some leaders told people that they have boundaries that were broken and now we have to go fight each other. Yeah. You have this story about World War One where the English and Germans on Christmas Eve set down their guns and sing yeah. sing Christmas yeah. Eve. Then then when Christmas is over, they pick their guns back up. What I would have done is said, this is crazy. I'm not picking my gun back up. I was just singing with my Lutheran brothers over there. Yeah. Why yeah, are we yeah. shooting each other? So coming out of these abusive situations where authority was totalitarian and terrible you can see someone saying yeah we need to rethink everything well actually you said you point out they were lutheran so i'm not sure (laughs) yeah well that's the Um, thing is for many people that must have been enough i'm church of england he's lutheran as i maybe maybe in the 17th century or 16th century yeah Uh, so so that story is supposed to make you feel warm and fuzzy no you got to talk about what happened on december 26th right yeah yeah it's um and of course so you can, that's what i was saying you can relate to the problems yeah of course. If we were talking about paulo freire and education in south america you can relate to the problems so there's there's so there's unlawful authority and then there's lawful authority that is sinful and mm-hmm. and so all those things appear to discredit authority more generally yeah. but you must have authority more broadly and generally you want it to be a lawful okay and 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 then b you want that authority to you you want it to be set up in such a way that the sinful tendencies of those authority figures will be disincentivized and checked okay but if you just throw out the baby with the bathwater and say we don't want authority yeah okay you you have anarchy well you get this weird situation we're in now where you you say there's no authority just me yeah okay great uh but then not even me like, I can't even be my own authority because I might be corrupted by, by you know, bad influences. So my past self from even an hour ago mm-hmm. doesn't hold any authority over me now because I found out my past self was uh, bigoted or something. Yeah. Now my yeah. current self is in charge. So, you, I mean, you, you have like not even moment by moment authority over yourself. Yeah. And it's just right. become a kind of reductio ad absurdum. The, pe- the paradox, of course, is that these very same people will then like support an authoritarian authoritarian government, which yeah. is odd. <laughs> you know, you have this like hyper individualism when it comes to, you know, all these other fields like uh, gender and sexuality and like what you do, whatever you want. Like there are no boundaries anymore, but uh, we're going to have a giant state that, that yeah. runs that make sure that you yeah. don't have those. Right. It's like, wait yeah. a second. You're, like, which one is it? Because you always like the 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 left-wing libertarian, you know, like who's, yeah. you know, uh, you know, that's a consistent man, at least, you know, like, but the, but the, to, to, to follow this hyper individualism, but then to commit yourself to, to, uh, authoritarian collectivism at the same time is bizarre to me, mm-hmm. but, um, well, let me suggest, here's what I would, how I'd identify the problem. <laughs> from, from the wars of religion and the totalitarian governments that led to those wars, down to World War One and World War Two, there's a fear in the West of ever repeating those, and because of that, there's a fear of religion. Uh, just this week, the Patriarch of Moscow said to Russians, "If you die in Ukraine, you're absolved of your sins." Hmm. And I thought I must have fallen into a time warp, and this is the 1200s or something. And, and you realize, well, yeah, they, the Russian church didn't have much effect from the reformation see i don't know that i don't know that um i don't know that the the move from away from religion as a result of the two world wars actually i think the two world wars were a result of the move away from religion. oh yeah no i'm talking about the fear of religions being in charge Hmm. in the west there's this idea that as soon as you put a religious idea in charge now you've got the 30 years war which is obviously not true but there's this fear of of that among secular elites yeah um so but here's here's what i would say 
you can recognize that and say, yeah, we don't want to ever have that sort of thing again. Mm -hmm. We also don't want to have secular totalitarians like we've seen in the 20th century. And the solution is we need to identify what our highest good is mm -hmm. and then be able to show how different institutions relate to the good. So, mm -hmm. so politics is not the same as family is not the same as church, but if you haven't identified what the highest good is, Marxism is a reaction against a failed conception of the good saying that it's heaven. Mm -hmm. and, Mar and, and so Marxism, Marx explicitly reacts against that, but then his, this worldly vision is equally empty. And I think the, the, I'll articulate the actual solution this way, that our highest good is to know God in all the ways that he's revealed himself in all of his works of creation and providence. And I get that from the shorter catechism on the first petition to the Lord's prayer, mm. that when we pray that God's name would be hallowed, that's what we're praying, that his name would be known. Mm. And, 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 and as reformed Christians, we believe that we know God only by the way he reveals himself. Mm. So that kind of gets back to your point about the pride of reason. If we think we can poke reason through behind revelation, we can't. Hmm. So God reveals himself in his works of both general and special revelation. Imagine that if Habermas had that solution. Um, last figure, and I know we're running short on time, so but he, he's important, yep. um, is Michel Foucault, French uh, social philosopher, um in, in the uh pr active primarily in the 1960s and 1970s um and for Foucault I mean his influence is just so vast I don't know about in philosophy but in history I mean in my graduate courses I had to read a couple books by I, uh the yeah. birth um discipline and punish birth of the prison madness and civilization of um, history of sexuality. I've never read that one. I've read on my own time, actually, Birth yeah. of, of the Clinic. Um, I've actually always been to read Madness and Civilization. But for Foucault, it, everything comes down to power and, mm -hmm. and knowledge and the relationship between power and knowledge. He he sees power and knowledge as, as used as a form of social control. Mm -hmm. to, and he identifies different types of power. Um, and when he talks about power, he's not talking of power in sort of the J.S. Mill, you know, sense of, you know, a, a state, you know, locking yeah. you up if you No, he, he has a broader definition um, where where power is this, uh, the inner working of this very complex group of ideas. Um, he sees power as, as existing everywhere throughout um, many uh, all human inter interactions actually i mean it's mm -hmm. it's basically like a web of yeah of, of power and um and that through all through society from top to bottom and everywhere in between and all throughout the web you have um norms and categories and 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 in his books he looks at medicine and health and sexuality and the prison system the definition of madness um and and systems of knowledge he believes are constructed and they've been constructed deliberately to to work for power um mm -hmm. for dominant for dominant groups um and and probably the most widespread form of power is what he calls what he calls disciplinary power which again is not external force but it's actually internalized yeah where um certain norms and patterns of behavior including right down to your very thoughts um, certain, uh, norms are encouraged and then deviations are corrected and are yeah. discouraged. Yeah. And that's where you get to that. What I was saying before, where you can't even trust yourself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, um, it's kind of, is somewhat resembles a false consciousness, um, uh, mm -hmm. that Marx talks about, and, but, but it's everywhere. It, it's in yeah. every human being has these, has this issue. Um, it's actually a very cynical way to view <laughs> the world. I mean, cause, mm -hmm. Um, and that's one critique of Crouteau is that there's no, there's no optimism here. I mean, like mm -hmm. for Foucault, well, there's no solution. The world, there's no redemption. Yeah, no, let's no say solution. he's right. I, that's the thing is I might be willing to say, sure. He's absolutely right about that. We don't know ourselves and, and the heart is deceptive and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm okay with, uh, we're reformed devils after all. Right. But, yeah. but that's all he has. Yeah. 
that's where yeah, it there's stops. no way out of this yeah you know and and it's it's really like this hopeless like situation where you you and that and so that's one difference with uh between Foucault and sort of the current day critical theorists is that they have like a message and a plan you know yeah well Habermas is very positive for. compared to that and and Habermas as well yeah. um one thing and you see here's the dark side you want to know the uh what does it say in the bible you know tree by its fruit yeah fruit okay yeah. um in the late 70s Foucault joined Sartre and uh, Derrida in signing a, a petition to to uh, decriminalize consensual sex between adults and minors. In France at the time, the age of consent was 15 years old, okay, which is a pretty low age of consent, actually. 15 years old was the age of consent. He wanted to decriminalize consensual sex between adults and minors under the age of 15, um, and it was all based on, and, and Jean-Paul Sartre and Derrida are in that group too. And I think Simone de Beauvoir also signed that, if I'm not mistaken. And, and it's all part of this idea that even that, that's, that sex and, and these nor this norm that we have prohibiting sex between adults and minors is, um, uh, is a social construct mm -hmm. and it's part of this web, yeah. uh, and, and it's, and I'll but it's what, interesting right. they zero in on, I'm sorry, I don't interrupt you, but they no, zero but, in on sex, right? That's what's interesting. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. all about, and Romans 1 zeroes in on mm -hmm. sex. Yep. There's something about sex mm -hmm. that- Well, that, and in the in the book of Revelation, the letters to the churches, the ones that have problems with either, uh, they name the Jezebel or Balaam or the Nicolaitans, it's all about idolatry and sex. Yep. So first you change the view of God, and from that sexuality changes. So you do wonder about that with Foucault because mm -hmm. of his own uh, sex life. Mm -hmm. I don't think we don't have to go into the details here, but yeah. you wonder which comes first. In other words, I want to live this way. Mm -hmm. Therefore I'll justify it. Or I got these ideas and then, Hey, it kind of leads me in this path. Right. And it feels like it's the first one Yeah, where, yeah. where they want to live a certain way. And then they, they just try to justify it. So anyway, that's that's Foucault in a very, very brief, brief nutshell. There's so much you could say about him. I, I, we don't want to belabor a point, but he's a huge key central figure also that yep. that um, people uh, uh, that the um, critical theorists utilize and and you just see it all throughout the literature um, yep. and the, the academic literature. Yeah, and, well, here's, and yep. what interests me too, so he does this history of madness and included in that is, for example, witchcraft, that people who are doing witches are crazy. And he'll, he outlines... Uh, consequences for people like somebody's uh, drawn and quartered and then disemboweled and then it's all burned and then the ashes are sprinkled to different parts of the earth it's, it's just sort of like yeah you do wonder like why are they doing those consequences to people um so that's where i said you can identify a problem <laughs> that, that's a that's not that shouldn't be the punitive outcome of having false beliefs about mm -hmm. witchcraft but then what's interesting in our day I don't think this was true even 30 years ago. What's true in our day is that there's a resurgence of belief that witchcraft is mm -hmm. uh, accurate. Well, and so and, it goes yep. from, look at the silly Christians in New England yep. who think witchcraft is real. It's not. And so they're persecuting people who just believe in Gandalf. It's a fiction. They know it. To a time where they're saying witchcraft is real. I can hurt you with witchcraft, but don't be afraid of it. Why are you worried about it? I was in a CVS uh, like a month ago and, th and they have the, those magazines and everything. And there was yeah. a big magazine. It was like by time, you know, which just goes to show that, yep. that all these corporate, you know, uh, outlets are like fully yep. behind so much of stuff. It was all about like the rise of witches and it was all positive, of course. Yeah. Um, so, it's, but, but it can't be both can it can't be both. It's okay. Don't worry about it. And it's real and is used to hurt enemies. Right. Also. Um, and, and so that, 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 that's a, such a good point though. Uh, oh, and because um, science and reason um, are increasingly identified by critical theorists as social constructs, as products. Or the of, male, their patriarchal male side of things. Of, of Western patriarchy. And so um, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, epistemic justice or research justice. Mm -hmm. And that's oh, this yeah. idea that, that uh, oh yeah, you're familiar, um, that, we, that, that um, academic research should be decolonized and that, that um, knowledge production that emphasizes 
and I, I'm not joking, that emphasizes evidence and, yeah. and reasoned argument is unfairly privileged over alternative mm -hmm. uh, forms of research, including Can you imagine what that would do superstition, for... you know, yeah. witchcraft, local uh, wisdom, lived, exp lived experience, lived experience is a big one. Yep. Yep. And, so I have my anecdote. Here's how I live my life. Yeah. And that's equal to you did a study of a thousand people with, with is a blind study. Those two things are equal. Yeah. But imagine what that would do. You're thinking about how, how that undermines and ends empirical science. Imagine what it does when it's brought into the law court. Yeah. Like we, we think it's funny. We make fun of the witch trials with like Monty Python mm -hmm. and, and deciting, Oh, does it, is it way the same as a, as a duck? Cause, cause it floats and ducks float. And we laugh at the kind of evidence, but right. that's what we would be doing then. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and this is what I try to tell people. Like, I mean, we take, you take for granted that this world that, you know, a lot of these, um, these products of, of, of Western civilization, you take those for granted, mm -hmm. and it's actually very fragile. I mean, like yeah. the whole base for most of world history, yep. like uh, you know, it wasn't assumed that empirical, you know, reasoned argument was a, was a, you know uh, was yeah, superior to superstition. You know, I mean, like, and and so don't take for granted that like you can't that society could not return back to like that pre yeah you know enlightened um, mode, and the enlightenment had many problems no doubt of course uh but but different for different reasons than what these people are saying well and i They're think that's the what... enlightenment was wrong because they it talked about the good you can have reason rationality whereas yeah. i was saying no the enlightenment is wrong because it it had sort of a an anti-theist assumption built into it but anyway yeah ahead. false yes it said we can use reason practical rationality to make our lives better without god and then unfortunately that fueled this this division between faith and reason so, oh yeah, the faith people will say, yeah, they do have reason on their side, but you got to have faith too, instead of saying, no, 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 that's not the use of reason. They're only using practical rationality. But I think this gives us two divisions in the groups we're talking about. The one side is the Habermas side, which says we can improve society. He sees the benefits of the enlightenment. And he just says, we're, we've just kind of stumbled. I think another one would be um, uh, Steven Pinker who wrote a book, Enlightenment Now, about five yeah. years ago, about all yeah. the benefits of the Enlightenment. So here's two atheists who want to continue those benefits. But then you have the other side of it, and they would say, no, the Enlightenment and colonialism go hand in hand. Yep. And so to kind of, as we wrap up, to bring this up to the present, from Foucault to the present, would be applying these thoughts to race differences, mm -hmm. critical race theory, yeah. and showing how embedded in every institution is an inherent racism mm -hmm. from the past that has to be undone. Now, I think if you examine, you'll see, well, these people are finding problems that are real problems mm -hmm. that we should be able to solve. The question is, say, in education, because that's where it kind of makes the news. Mm -hmm. In education, you might have inequalities, and you want to say, well, why is that happening? What's, what's the cause of these things? Mm -hmm. And that's really where the difference comes in. The, the difference isn't that we don't agree there's these problems. The difference is in the proposed solutions. Right, right. And um, and this is another like big difference with Foucault because Foucault would have like completely shirked back at the thought of having like race as like a fixed category, as a category. Yeah, yeah, that's what's um, interesting, huh? <laughs> you know, for him, that too, like race itself as a concept is a product of power and, and, and all the rest. And he would have, but so there's been a, um there there's a quite a divergence there with sort of the original like um raw Foucauldianism mm -hmm. um and um uh yeah so so why does all this matter someone could say okay you guys are finished it's fun we we I learned some things but why does all this matter what would, what would you say um I, because it 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 infiltrates it, it, it it's it's all over the place now um uh it's um in every institution um we see a lot of these assumptions baked into the universities obviously k through 12 um uh, but also corporate america um and then within within academia various fields are just heavily heavily influenced by this and you're and and if you're a parent watching this your children are when they go to K through 12, and then later when they go on to college, they're learning a lot of this. Uh, they're taught a worldview that is um, in line, uh, either 
uh, uh, consciously or, or heavily influenced by everything we've just spoken of. And, um, and, and, you know, there's, um, you see people criticizing or making a point, oh, like critical race theory, for example, which is just one form of critical theory. Critical race theory, that's just some obscure, like legal, like law school like, yeah. thing. And that's not true. Actually, if you don't mind, it will just take me like 30 seconds. Yep, to read. Do it. I looked up, this is from two critical race theory scholars. So critical race theory, it originated with Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Bell Hooks, a lot of these people. Um, and a few years back in the early 2010s, there was a, a book, a serv, uh, like a textbook, Critical Race Theory, an Introduction, and it's authored by Richard, De Richard Delgado and John Stefanik, and they're like big critical race theorists, top level academics, and they say this on page three in the introduction. The critical race theory or CRT movement is a collection of activists and scholars, and that's another... Thing about critical theory there's an activism component activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationship among race racism and power the movement considers many of the same in issues that conventional civil rights which we would agree with and ethnic studies discourses take up but places them in a broader perspective that includes economics history setting group and self-interest and emotions and the unconscious Unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which would say, hey, everybody should be legal under the, the rule of law and like we should treat our treat us the way we want to be treated and love our neighbor as ourselves. Unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which stresses incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism. Bam, there you go. And neutral principles of constitutional law, end quote. So that's right straight from the horse's mouth. That's a yeah, great quote to end with. And 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 it says this is not just some like obscure like yep. thing in a law school somewhere. No, it 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 filters. It has it proposed from... just like the other ones we've been looking at, uh beginning all the way back in the 1920s with with the Frankfurt Institute, mm -hmm. it has a proposed uh model for how it wants society to look. Mm -hmm. And so we might agree with some of the problems that are identified. And I say we might agree with some of them because sometimes problems are identified because they don't live up to your ideal and your ideal is false. Mm -hmm. But other times you say, yeah, there really is a problem here. We all agree we need to solve this problem. This solution won't work because it's built on false ideas. Mm -hmm. So that's why, I mean, for my takeaway would just be, we need to be aware of the ideas that shape culture and not be living in a fideistic cave somewhere where we assume our view is true. We actually have to get out there and it might require that you, the listener, actually wonder, how do I know what I think is true? Mm -hmm. And if you haven't gone through that work yourself, you're not really going to be able to offer a critique of another philosophy. Right. And so like um, in, the, in U.S. history, in your K through 12, right, even teaching things like the American Revolution and the yeah. Declaration of and Independence how you teach them. is influenced by by everything we just talked about today because according to like critical theory the Declaration of Independence there's not like some you know timeless truths involved in there no it's it's sort of this deconstructionist project yeah. of 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 reading meaning into the text and in detecting these hidden like hidden um, motives, motives. Yeah. And, and 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 because they were authored because the Declaration of Independence in particular was authored by a white male slave owner that that immediately everything in that is suspect. And, yeah. it, and, it, and, um, and so even concepts like the revolution or the constitution, mm -hmm. James Madison, a slave owner. So, uh, so the argument would be made, well, slavery is baked into our system. Mm -hmm. It's part of the superstructure that has created all the all the social problems and so therefore it must be done away with and it's like whoa 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 yeah. wait a second actually the constitution there are you know there are like there are truths that transcend the yeah. men who like pen wrote it. put the the men who wrote those things and so all of this has a big impact well how about this here's what i, I would say to wrap it up yep yes and 
In other words, I, I don't feel necessarily called to defend the founders from those accusations mm -hmm. because I think it's much worse than the critical race theorist thinks. So if they says, well, they were slave owners and racists, yeah, and they also were in rebellion against God and needed redemption. Mm -hmm. So it's they're they're getting to like if sin is this deep, they're getting like here. Mm -hmm. And they're not looking at the fact that not only did they mistreat fellow humans, they mistreated God. Mm -hmm. And that's even true of the one, you know, if someone says they're a Christian, you still see how sin influences their mind. And so what, what we don't want to do is just think of sin as the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. That's built on the first one, love the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. And so all of these social movements are at their best, just getting us to the second one, loving your neighbor at their best. Sometimes they don't even yeah. do that. Yeah. None of them are calling us to love God with all our heart. Well, and and in, that's what we have to do. In Roman Catholicism, one of the seven virtues that they identified was charity. Mm -hmm. And what is charity? Charity actually is love for God. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you love your neighbor. Yep. And Absolutely. So, yep. Yep. So I think that's what we would say is we, we're offering a critique of the critique. And we've got two episodes now with that. And our third one, we, we have already received some questions. And if you have some questions about today's uh, discussion, put them on either one of our, our video, our, our YouTube channels. And in our third episode next time, we're going to go over those questions together. And then after that, we're going to get into uh, education funding and what Arizona has done that might be the beginning of a change across the United States, because other states are probably going to want to follow suit. Yeah, it's very exciting. So thanks yeah. for thanks for listening. Bye, everyone. All right, good. Um, that was probably way, that was way. Long. It was long, but it was great. <laughs> I didn't say anything because we're doing fine. <laughs>